Hello and welcome. Today we're going to do some eigenfunction example problems. So I'll start with this first problem. Again, we're just going to knock these out kind of quick, showing you how to do them efficiently, uh, something you want to practice for your upcoming exam. So here's what we're given. And we have a boundary condition. Okay, so there's our thing. And so the, the goal, what we'll have here, our goal, our goal is uh, find all eigenfunctions and value pairs, uh, specify uh, indexes, so n equals i.e. n equals 1, 2, and so on, um, to, uh, to, to get all of them. All right, so when we, what's really important here, when I say find all of them, we don't want to miss any single one of them, okay? Uh, so we'll want to see if we can get all of them. Uh, but this often happens in my exams. I often say, okay, you may only consider uh, a specific case, cases, the, the case where lambda is less than zero. Okay? All right, let's do this. All right, so this, obviously, this, this, case where lambda is less than zero, that's a time saver. So it, it helps you uh, be more efficient in your work that you don't have to look at the other cases. Uh, so it just minimizes the amount of work that you're doing. All right, so let's start this problem. Okay, we start with the characteristic, uh, the, the characteristic equation, which is e to the rx is equal to u. We plug it into the differential equation, we'll get r squared e to the rx is equal to lambda e to the rx, which implies, of course, that r squared is equal to lambda. And that means that r is equal to plus or minus root lambda. Okay, so we know that lambda is less than zero. That was a fact that was in the beginning of the problem. So what the, that means is this is going to be imaginary. Okay, and to help out with this, we can just go plus or minus. We'll actually do a negative negative there. So I'll multiply by negative 1. So that means, of course, that negative lambda is actually a positive number. What we can do here, then, is go plus or minus i times root negative lambda. Okay, so that's a nice trick for kind of just moving the imaginary bit into that negative 1. Right, but for notational simplicity, I'm going to make that into omega, i.e., I'm just going to do a notation change here where omega equals root negative lambda. And all that means is this is just easier to write. Okay, and that just helps our just keep the, the notational work down. Okay, so with this, now we want to see if we can figure out how to uh, get further with this one. Uh, so we have imaginary uh, characteristic values. And that means we can use trigonometric trig functions for the solution. All right, so we can do that. What we're going to do is say u of x is equal to c1 cosine omega x plus c2 sine omega x. I'll just erase that. That arrow is in my ray. 
where uh, where the C1 and C2 are those free parameters. Okay, so this right here represents that general solution. What we want to find now is a specific solution. We have to satisfy the boundary conditions. All right, so to do that, we need to look at those boundary conditions. So let's say we know our first boundary condition is u at pi is equal to zero, and u prime at zero is equal to zero. Let's look at this one first. u prime of x is equal to negative omega times c1 sine omega of x plus um, uh, omega times c2 of cosine omega of x. All right, and now we're going to evaluate at zero, and that's going to turn, the first term will just disappear, but then we'll get this second term that says that C2 times omega times cosine of zero is equal to zero. That's just one, so that implies, of course, that C2 times omega is equal to zero. But we know that omega is positive, therefore C2 has to be zero. Okay, so that definitely helps us out. Uh, let's see if we can go a little bit further here and now look at the other boundary condition. Um, u at pi, well, we can write this now as c1 times cosine of omega times pi, and that's equal to zero. Remember the other term, we already found out that c2 was zero, so I don't even need to put it down there anymore. So if we use the information from the other boundary condition to help us constrain the, the second boundary condition that we're looking at. All right, so this is what we want. When is this zero? So what we don't, what we want C1, we want to not be equal to zero here. So it must be that omega pi must equal uh, pi halves or any anything plus two, uh, anything plus pi. So what we have here is pi halves plus any multiple of pi after that. And this is for n equals zero, one, two, three, four, up for forever. And it's really important that we write this. We we have to keep track of all of our of all of our values here, particularly where it starts, that it's zero. We need to remember that it's zero. So that means omega n is equal to uh, one half plus n where n is equal to 0, 1, 2, and so on and so forth, okay? All right, so that's good. And that means then that lambda n is equal to negative quantity 1 half plus n squared. And we have our eigenfunction un's. They're going to be equal to, well, again, we had them right there. It's that cosine. It's going to be cosine of one half plus n times x. And that's going to be for n equals 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on. So right there, that's a perfect answer. And it's really important that we also write all the n values there. But there there's a good example of a problem we can do uh, to, to find eigenfunctions. That's fairly straightforward. It has all the pieces to it. Um, okay, so I'll let this video end here. I think this is a good example, uh, and we'll pick it up in another video to do more examples. But this is a good representative example of a problem you might see on an exam.